So number two, this here is the ground state wave function for a hydrogen like atom, which means anything with one electron. And Z is the number of protons in the nucleus. So for helium, you have two protons in the nucleus, so Z is two. For hydrogen, Z is one. Um, <clears throat> these are both with the assumption of an infinitely mass nucleus. So that's why there's no difference for hydrogen and helium other than the value of Z. And so you have these two, and it asks us, calculate the probability that an electron ends up in the ground state of HE3 if it starts um, tritium and becomes. So basically what you're doing is is that calculation. And HE is helium and TR is tritium. And they're spaced out just because <laughs> I wanted to make sure we had the bra separate from the ket instead of thinking that HE might go with the ket. So the or maybe, has maybe a I should. Equation to it. The what? The tritium has a different equation to it. It has a different Z. Right. Tritium. Come on, stop. Tritium is hydrogen 3, so Z is 1. And the helium here was helium 3. And so this is, the lower number is the Z. And so these are going to be the same except for the Z values. So I'm just wondering if it's a 40-point problem. So if it's just doing the integral of that, what's the catch to it that makes it worse? Um, I don't think it's simple. Doing the integral? Okay. Can we use an integral table to do that? Um, yes, I expect you will. But I'm... <clears throat> Yeah, so that's what that one is. And then, like I said, this one here, this one here is dealing with angular momentum. And I, I think it's pretty self-contained. It rotates in a plane about an axis going through the center. So you have, that's your picture. And then you want to calculate what the actual values are for it to, that are available to it. And we, we, haven't, we haven't covered that aspect yet. And so that's not something that you can do yet today. And then this last one, use the ladder operators to calculate what you get with this. So what you're going to do is just use LX is equal to, and I have to write these down, since L plus is equal to LX plus ILY. Then and L minus is changing that sign. Then L plus plus L minus is equal to two LX. So LX is equal to. So you substitute that for LX, and then you just do the commutator or not the commutators, but the um, the operators acting on the states. Um, okay, so with the um, with the ladder operators, the and this this here is something I, I don't actually I can add another page. What am I thinking? So, the ladder operators. L plus acting on L comma M is equal to H bar L comma M plus one. If I am remembering correctly, I didn't bring my textbook. 
but that's that's what the ladder operator does. It raises the M state, leaves the L state the same. And I think we said that its value is plus or minus H bar plus H bar for not the minus. Yeah, textbook isn't front cover. Front cover is always in the first place to check. It opens in just the right place. This says, yeah, it's been working here. Um, we we did not derive this one now, which is why why we have to look here. Okay, so okay, so I wasn't quite right. LC acting on LM is H bar M. Oh wait, no, that's LC. That's not that place. Yeah, I knew that one. <coughs> there it is. L plus minus of this F means state. It's just like right state. Yeah. So that would be like wait. Um, yeah. The the F with M L and M is the same as putting a cat to L common. That's like I said, much easier to me to use the cat. And then we have A M L. So I guess yeah. It's a little more complicated because you have to actually use that. So you have to use equation four point one two one. So that was not right. I, I hope I put the M and L in the right place there. What's the equation number 4.141? One, one, two. And it is, and it raised the M to M plus one, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, because it had the L plus or minus in front. So you have this that you have to go through with these. So you'll have, that's the L plus, and then you have the L minuses in that same, um, on that same page with the L minus acting on L and M is. And keep in mind that That if you try to raise from the maximum state, you get zero, because there is no raised state from m equals l. And likewise, if you try to lower from the minimum state, you get zero. The, the work there on the page that I refer to is going through the process of, of what the raise and lowering operators actually tell us. And it uses that as a starting point. That what I've written here is the starting point. So going back to the problem, what? So, Why is it written this LM1 like um, Because it's easier. Right? The, this here, writing L comma M1 is equivalent to what you have in the textbook there is F with the subscript of what does it have M as the subscript or superscript? I don't recall. Okay. So that means I probably had this backward too. So this is just a an easier way of writing that, Should I think. Be wrong, um, well, th this is ket. You you have the f m one l star should be bra. The if the operator is here, it's easiest to have it act on that one. Or you can take the complex conjugate of the operator, which makes it the raising operator acting on the ket is the same as putting the complex conjugate, which is the lowering operator acting on the bra. Right, because the, the relationship is L minus is complex conjugate of L plus. Yes, but I just don't understand 
So the, you're using the ladder operator on LM2. You would you would use the raising operator on LM2. How do you well, do that? LX. Okay. So going to what the raising. Let me. I know writing a second time is kind of like yelling, expecting somebody to understand, but I try to explain differently as I do it. So L plus is defined as LX plus ILY. And L minus is defined as LX minus ILY. So if I am looking for LX in terms of L plus and L minus, because the problem says to use the latter operators. So that's why I know I'm looking for it in terms of that. Then I'm going to take these and add these together. And so where it says LX, I'm going to replace it with this. So I'm using it in terms of the ladder operators. And then if I want LY, I just go through the same work. <laughs> Made the wrong thing. It disappeared. The same work, but now I'm going to subtract them. So before I had added them, if I subtract them, then I will have I don't know why I have an I here. There's no I there. And so I've just recast my L plus and my L or my L X my L Y in terms of the ladder operators. Shouldn't both of those second terms be L minus, not L Y? Yes. <laughs> yes. Otherwise, I would have myself a. Well, that was right. I'd have myself a not yet solved solution there, and not in terms of the right thing. So yes. So to actually have those operators, that L plus plus L minus over two acting on state LM, mm -hmm. do we just distribute the L plus and the L minus somewhere? Right, right. So if you have L comma M1, LX, L comma M2, that's equal to Thomas. Right, that's what you'd asked. And so then you need to calculate what this is. And remember, after I, I do this, I'm going to have that for the first term and what is so I'm not writing the second term I'm just doing this what is that equal to draw ln1 get ln plus m2 plus 1 
it, it actually simplifies to something very simple. Is it like the direct? Yes. Okay, L comma L, that's always going to be one, right? Because L is always equal to L. And that's the second part. You have two deltas, because one for the first, one for the L's, one for the M's. Both of them have to be equal or it's going to be zero because of orthogonality. So those two would be zero? Well, the, this one here is always going to be one. Yeah. So and then this one here is zero unless M2 plus one is equal to M1. So unless M2 is one less than M1. Um, because it, the problem just says for arbitrary M1 and M2. And so if, if it turns out that M1 is 0 and M2 is minus 1, then that's 1. Okay, so the M1 doesn't mean M equals 1. No, no. Okay. Correct, correct. Okay. you consider any possibility of making one of these an extra credit question or something to make it a little bit? I don't think this is uh, an extraordinary long assignment. Well, I, I recognize that. But it's, you know, this, the, the number three, um, we have started lecturing, you know, there, today's lecture is not going to cover it. And then we have Monday's lecture and Tuesday's lecture. You know, if we don't cover it in Monday and Tuesday's lecture, well, then I would take it off because you wouldn't have the lecture on it in time to get the homework done. Right. But this, I mean, in theory, it's over stuff we haven't talked about yet. And so three of them are things we've talked about. If, if you have time problems, come back to me. Don't just say, oh, you know, he said no. All right. We are sticking with electron spin. And we have among the first like six or seven slides, there's a lot of stuff that I talked about yesterday that I just have a little, you know, formal slides on them. So we, of course, we looked at the information about the different colors of absorption or emission seen in, for instance, here, the hydrogen atom. And something that is kind of glossed over up to this point is that that's not exactly what happens. It's pretty close. If you were in a general physics class this morning, you would have thought it was just what happens, right? But it's not exactly that. And so here is one thing that comes out wrong. You have a 3s, and if you, if you have an electron that starts in a 3s state for hydrogen, and it goes down to a 2p, it actually splits and gives you two lines instead of just one line, which indicates that there must be two different energy levels for 2p. And you see there, it's marked with J equals 3 halves and J equals 1 half. We haven't talked about J at all, right? J is a combined angle momentum number, combining both the spin angle momentum or spin magnetic moment, totally honest, but we say angle momentum, and the orbital. And so there is, even though you're in a, a 2p, which means that you have L is equal to 1, the spin could be aligned with it or against it. And so you could have two different values for the total angular momentum, either 1 plus a half or 1 minus a half, right? 1 for the, for the L and then plus a half or minus a half for the M. So well, actually not for the M, for the S. And so that's something that still needs to be taken into account. And now Chad came and talked to me and asked about extra credit. And I was thinking, you know, I don't want extra credit to be meaningless. 
I want to be something that is beneficial. So, you know, something that was suggested was, you know, just, you know, like redo homework problems that were wrong or something. It probably isn't going to have much learning. It would just be an exercise in taking your time. And there's no point in taking your time. So I came up with this. Um, for a 5% addition to your total grade, you can write a paper about perturbation theory. And I chose this. I was talking to Dr. Osborne and, and got this idea and he thought it was a good one. In this class, the whole point for you guys as chemists is to have a better understanding of what's going on behind the scenes, if you will, with chemistry, what makes it work. And I've been telling you that, you know, for instance, the third row doesn't have a 3D in it. That doesn't appear until the fourth row. And it's because N is not the end all for telling us the energy. And so perturbation theory is the theory that we use to calculate the corrections to what we have already done. And so what I am asking here for extra credit is to write a paper with appropriate citation. And your textbook, by the way, is chapter six in your textbook that covers this. It is a great source. You could probably just use that, but you might decide that there's another source that you like better. That talks about what perturbation theory is. You do not need to go through the mathematics of it just the ideas involved um, because I want you to actually understand this is how they take care of these problems and then what each of these problems are the non-infinite mass of the nucleus the Zeeman effect now the Zeeman effect is not really a problem it's just something we didn't count for what happens when you put an atom in a magnetic field that's what the Zeeman effect is um, relativistic correction because the electrons are moving at relativistic speeds Spin orbit coupling, which is the coupling between the angular momentum of the electron's spin and, which of course means its intrinsic magnetic moment, and its orbit about the nucleus. And then spin spin coupling, which is the coupling between the electron's spin and the nucleus' spin. So, discuss what each of those are and how they affect our energy levels. And so, you know, I'm looking for, I mean, this is a significant, 5% of your grade, you got it, that's pretty significant. Um, and so I'm asking for you to do a significant amount of work, not just, you know, like a two-page paper, but something that, that is actually looking into this that shows that you actually have some understanding of what these additional considerations are. Um, just as a, a reference, here's the spreadsheet that I made for looking at the shifts from here's what you get taking into account the first correction the, real, um, the fact that the nucleus is not infinite in mass so you can't I, I didn't even calculate anywhere here the value that you get with the mass of the nucleus not being infinite but just um, I'm looking for a pointer when I realize I can use this This here is the mass of an electron. And this here is what we call the reduced mass. The reduced mass is what we replace the mass of the electron with to account for the nucleus not having an infinite mass. That's not a big shift, is it? It's not a big shift because the nucleus is so much more massive than the electron. And if you were to go to something like helium, where the nucleus is four times more massive, it would be an even smaller shift. On the other hand, if you have an electron orbiting a positron, you can do this. You can make a, an atom-like structure with a positron and an electron orbiting each other. Notice I said orbiting each other. Technically, the nucleus and the electron orbit each other, but the nucleus moves so little, we treat it as not moving which is the infinite mass idea for the nucleus. But if you have a positron electron, they're both going to be moving the same amount. And in that case, your reduced mass is going to be one half the mass of an electron. So, you know, that's, that's not a common, it's not an atom, right? It's not part of our periodic table. 
but it's something where you can see, ah, yeah, yeah, that, that does make a difference in some cases. Or, well, to put something else, um, something that, that my son Nathan's been excited about is um, muonic hydrogen. Muonic hydrogen is where instead of having an electron orbit, you have a muon orbit. Now, are you guys familiar with a, what a muon is? Okay, um, back there in the, the table, or the graph to the left of the periodic table, we have the fundamental particles. And we have, and I'll just go back here, because I can't read from there, I don't know if you can or not. But we have here the electron and the light neutrino is the first generation of electron. The second generation is the muon and a middle neutrino. The muon here has a mass that is 0.106, or about 200 times the mass of the electron, 0.00511. Um, 200, yeah. So it's about 200 times more massive than an electron, otherwise it's the same. So if you have an electron that's a muon instead of an electron, so it's not an electron, but if you have a muon in the position of an electron, you still form a hydrogen atom. But the hydrogen atoms can have different energy levels because the mass now is the mass of a muon. And so that's, that's that correction that's not shown. Then I have these here are no magnetic field. So if you go to a region with no magnetic field, but you include the, and this one I only did the relativistic and spin orbit coupling. With the um, relativistic and spin orbit coupling, you have it split into two energy levels, just like was shown here. But then if you put in a magnetic field, it splits all into crazy, <laughs> crazy levels. So you can see it actually, you have these two that are, I think they're virtually, but not exactly on top of each other. And yeah, I would have to, I, all the numbers that I used are in this table here. These are the numbers in the central part. And these are the numbers in the last part. And so you can see how these energies all get split up because of these perturbations. And so when you're doing spectroscopy, knowing this structure is really important because you can have decays from these into something else. Now, there is another aspect of spectroscopy that I really should state just right now so we have it on the record. We have conservation laws, and so we have things like conservation of momentum if there's no net external force. We also have conservation of angular momentum. And so it turns out that when I have a, an electron changing from one energy level to another energy level, you're giving off a photon. The photon has angular momentum, believe it or not. And because the photon is carrying away angular momentum, you have to have a change in your L, because of that angular momentum that's carried away, it has to be a change of one. And your M sub L could change by one, zero, or minus one, if I remember the selection rules correctly. So you can't go from one state in the, like, you know, so you go from N equals three to N equals two. You can't go from any state N equals three to any state N equals two, because you have to follow the right delta L. So if you're in n equals 3, l equals 1, if you go to n equals 2, you can only go to l equals 0. can't stay at l equals 1. So that means that you don't have all of the spectral lines that you would predict if you just looked at these energy levels. So it gets more complicated. <laughs> the more you learn, the more complicated it gets. But when you learn about spectroscopy, which I'm assuming you've done some spectroscopy in chemistry, knowing these selection rules and knowing why they appear, you know, why this doesn't appear and so on are important things. And so the, the point of the extra credit assignment is to understand how we get to these actual observables. These themselves are not observable. What's observable is the electrons jumping from one of these to another one. This is in the N equals two. So, N equals 2, you can see here I have L equals 1 or L equals 0. 
if you drop to n equals one, what L values are possible? Just L equals zero, which means that you could not have a decay from these states. It's not allowed because that would have L staying the same. And so you only have the other decays, those starting energies, and then you look at the ending. You can see it's kind of, kind of interesting, right? Okay, so, and of course, I will post this on Moodle so you have the instructions there. I mean, I will post the lecture outline that will have the instructions. What is this? Um, yeah, what does it do is a good question. And I was thinking, let's make it do the last Monday of the semester. So a week and a couple days, does that work? I mean, I could put it Friday. The thing is, we have a lot of assignments due Friday. And I don't want to have an extra thing piled on your plate at the last minute. It's like the Monday of finals. Uh, no, the Monday before finals, a week before. No, the Monday of finals, I think that would be horrible bad because then that puts something that you're like, do I have this done when you should be preparing for finals? Sure. What about like the Wednesday? So I, I could do Wednesday as well. I, I, I'm working on So Wednesday? Yeah. Okay. I, I just don't want to... Um, you know, to have things pile up on you. Yeah. And I know you guys are both very mature students who probably don't put, I know you don't put things off to the last minute, but that's, that's really the reason to, to do this is to protect students who put things off to the last minute from themselves. Thanks for it. Yeah. Okay. Now, now that we're more than halfway through the lecture, hey, let's do some lecture material. So classical spin. Classical spin, you have angular momentum. And notice here I did circular. If you're going in a circle, your angular momentum is the mass times the radius times the speed. Now we know for our atoms, we've completely thrown out the Bohr idea, or not, well, it was Bohr, it was also, also Rutherford, of the electrons doing circular orbits. But for calculational purposes, we're going to stick with that just to make our lives easy to think about. Right, so it's just to make the math easy. So the orbital angular momentum is the mass of the orbiting object times the radius of its orbit times the speed of its orbit. Now, if you think about this, if I have an object like this, the Earth orbiting the sun, in the absence of any kind of material in the universe other than those two things, right, it's, it's special, then there's nothing that's going to take away any momentum from the Earth. And so the Earth's orbit should maintain constant angular momentum. Well, what happens if the Earth gets closer to the sun? If the angular momentum stays the same, just using this equation as a guide, if R decreases, what's going to have to happen? No, angular momentum can't decrease. Something else, and which one's it going to be? Yeah, probably not the mass, probably the speed. The Earth does move closer and farther from the sun. So we are closest to the sun around January 5. We are farthest from the sun around July 5. And so that means when we're closer to the sun, we're moving faster. When we're farther from the sun, we're moving slower. So we move more slowly in the summer than we do in the winter. By a small fraction. But that's, and that's, that's an area where any length is important. And it's important for us to think about those ideas just to gel in our minds what we're really talking about. Now, you have the Earth also spins on its axis. And once again, I'm not going to be doing any spinning because I'm worried about my knee. But it spins on its axis. And so this here, now, for your homework problem where you have the C and the N, the cyanide, cyanide, yeah, sorry. Where is it going to orbit about? Okay, if you have two masses that are orbiting around each other. It's pretty much the same as the idea if you have two people on a teeter tot. If they're going to be balanced, because when they're orbiting, they're going to be balanced. 
what is the balance point? The center of mass. Not just the center. Because if you have, if it's you on one side and me on the other, I weigh a lot more than you. Oh, but and so that, they were equal. I didn't understand what you were saying. Good. Okay, if I said that, then I didn't mean to. Okay, so if, if I'm on one side and you're on the other, the balance point's going to be a lot closer to me. And so we call that point the center mass, which you calculate just by taking, you know, to decide, okay, I'm going to consider Richard as position zero and and Aaron is three meters away. And so we take Richard's mass times zero plus Aaron's mass times three meters away. Then we divide by the total mass, and that gives us the position of the center mass. And that's where the balance point would be for the teeter That's where the balance point is going to be for that homework problem. You just say, okay, I'm going to consider which one is more mass, if carbon or nitrogen. Nitrogen is. So I'm just going to start with nitrogen and say, okay, mass of nitrogen times zero plus the mass of carbon times the length of separation, which I think it just uses a variable, you don't put a number for it. And that gives me how far, as a function of the separation, the balance point is the center mass. And so then the orbiting around there, and then you can simply calculate the angular momentum by calculating the moment of inertia. Moment of inertia for a point, so for the homework problem, moment of inertia is equal to m r squared. So once I've determined what the radius is from the center point to carbon and the center point to nitrogen, then I can calculate what the moment inertia of inertia is for each one, one of those and add them up to get the moment of inertia for my molecule about a center of mass. And so you're going to need to calculate the moment of inertia for the molecule. So it'll be M1R1 squared plus M2R2 squared, where R1 and R2 are the distances from the center of mass. And you are choosing one. Yeah, I, I choose one arbitrarily be a distance of zero just for calculating where the center mass is. Once I calculate the center mass, then all I care about is what is R1 and what is R2. And th those are both positive numbers. So you'll need to calculate that moment of inertia. And then your kinetic energy is one half I omega squared which also comes into the calculation. Now, this is not everything you need to know, just showing you the tie-ins here. Now, the spin angle momentum is calculated using the second equation. That is, angle momentum is calculated as moment of inertia times omega. So L equals I omega, which is actually what you're working with, right? You're calculating L's. And if the Earth was a solid sphere that was uniform, then it's two-fifths mass of the Earth is its mode of, times race of the Earth squared is its mode of inertia. And so you have the, the point of this slide. I, I, I did a whole lot to tie this into homework problem three for next week. Still doesn't give you what you need for homework problem. It gives you some starting points. The point of this is you have two angular momenta associated with the Earth orbiting the Sun. One with the actual orbit, and one with the Earth spinning at the same time. So it's, a nice, it's an easy to understand concept that if we had an electron orbiting the nucleus like a planet orbiting the Sun, think Rutherford's model, then you should have two angular momenta that you're dealing with. And so when scientists noticed this split here, they said, well, it's behaving like you have another angular momentum term. And so they said it makes perfect sense then that that second angular momentum term would be the spin angular momentum. That's where the idea comes from. And I don't know, to my brain, it makes complete sense. Does it sound reasonable or does it sound, I mean, I know I've told you many times it's not true, but does it sound reasonable to your brain or does it sound confusing? 
not super clear. Well, the bottom line is they saw a behavior that suggested that they had two different magnetic moments at play. And they said, well, and the next slide deals with angle momentum to magnetic moment. So they said, well, it looks like we have two different angular momenta. Hence, it's behaving like the Earth spinning and orbiting. So they made the direct analogy. It really is very, you know, very um, planetary model description of what's going on. So let's talk about that magnetic moment. What is the magnetic moment? It is the magnetic field that is being created. So if I have charge going in a circle, what we've done in the past is we had B is equal to something like mu watt I times the number of turns divided by the length of a solenoid, right? We have something like that. Well, this is not wired with current going through it. So that's not going to work exactly the same for us. But here is a generalized calculation. Now it's magnetic moment instead of magnetic field, but the two are related. The magnetic moment is equal to the charge divided by two times m. I think m is the mass here, isn't it? And then the angular momentum vector. So it's in the same direction as the angular momentum if q is positive. If Q is negative, it's the opposite direction. So we've been talking about angular momentum all the way up until now, and this is our connection between angular momentum and magnetic field, or magnetic moment. And the reason this is important is because what's observable to us? The angular momentum is not directly observable. The behavior in magnetic field is observable. And so getting to the magnetic moment is getting to the observable. So we've been talking about angular momentum like it's an observable. It's inferable from the observable. Now, more generally, we take that term out front, the Q over 2M, and we call that the gyromagnetic ratio, gamma. And so the, the lower equation mu vector, that's the magnetic moment with the direction, is equal to gamma L. That's a short way of saying we have a relationship between the magnetic moment and the angular momentum. And here's something that's important. This gamma is different depending on what you're dealing with. Right? So it's, it's not the same for, let's say, an electron as it is for a proton. It's going to be different because it depended on the charge. Well, proton and electron have the same magnitude, just different sign, but also on the mass. So it's, it's going to be different. I've already talked about this, right? The magnetic moment was inferred from the fine spectrum, from that splitting that we talked about. Um, the current understanding is that that's wrong. It's just wrong. <laughs> there is instead an intrinsic magnetic moment to the electron. Now, if it's intrinsic, you can't make a wave function for it, right? It's intrinsic. It just has it. So... That means that we can't use a Schrodinger equation, but we can still use, and we must use, we have no choice but to use Heisenberg's matrix method. So when we deal with spins, our spin states, we can't do a wave function type thing for it. We can just say we have this or this and work with matrices. But all the commutator relations that we've learned, the things like between L squared and LZ and so on, and the ladder operators, all of those are still going to hold true because we're still dealing with an angular momentum-like property. Now, we're not doing the proof here, but in your textbook, you have equation 419, where it was discovered that the ladder operators actually allow for two distinct types of spin, or types of angular momentum, I should say either a momentum that has one half integer values, things like minus one half, plus one half, plus three halves, plus side halves, or integer values. And I talked about this in class yesterday. What do we call it if the angular momentum has integer values, like L is, you know, L is equal to zero, one, two, three. 
We call those bosons. What do we call them if they have half integers? Fermions. And electrons, protons, neutrons, they're all fermions. So the Pauli exclusion principle, which only applies to fermions, would apply to all of those. Which leads to some interesting things when you get to nuclear physics. Because if you have a nucleus, you have protons, and the protons are fermions, and so you must have some kind of shell structure, the same as we have a shell structure for the electrons. Because you can't, you can have two protons in the lowest energy level. The third one can't be in the same energy level. It's going to have to be in a higher energy level. And so a lot of our understanding of the periodic table stems from this same Pauli exclusion principle. And I know, at least in all of my chemistry classes, never once has a teacher said anything about the Pauli exclusion principle applying to protons or to neutrons. But it does. Now, you can have a proton and a neutron with the same spin state and in their ground states because they're different. They're differentiable. Right? You aren't going to get a proton and a neutron confused. So they have spin of one half. That's what makes them fermions. And so we will designate spin states with S M sub S, just like we designated angular momentum states with L, and technically we should have been using M sub L, right? And we don't have anything else. We don't have a function we can put to it. We just have the state, which I think of as easier, right? There's no, there's no calculus you can do without a function, right? You can still close your bra and your cat and have your rules, but you can't actually do the calculus. So, so life is easier. So we have our S squared operator instead of L squared operator. So S squared acting on S M sub S gives me H bar squared S times S plus one. We went through this in class yesterday. Remember? You remember. Comedian. <laughs> And so we calculated that we would have three quarter h bar squared for s squared. So the angular momentum from the spin is always going to be square root of three quarters times h bar. No one ever talks about it because it's always the same. If it was different, yeah, we'd talk about it. But it's always the same. Nobody worries about it. And then the component in the z direction is going to be plus or minus h bar over two for the Z component of the spin. That's the one you always talk about. And so you, what do you usually say in chemistry for your spin states? Okay. My experience, we always said spin up or spin down. And spin up means that S sub Z is plus H bar over two. Spin down means S sub Z is minus H bar over two. And what does that mean? It means if I put in an external magnetic field, that I am going to measure a different energy state because of the spin either being aligned with or against the magnetic field. So it, it relates to an observable. And so when you show filling of electrons in an atom, you always show them, and I'm just going to go straight to, to Hoon's rule here because I feel like it. We only have four minutes left. Your mom just went. <laughs> when you put electrons in, like let's say we're filling electrons in a carbon atom. So in the carbon atom, we're going to have two electrons in the n equals one state. And then in the n equals two state, we're going to have a total of four because that's how many we can put in, or that's how many we have left. It'll be 2n and 2p, right? Wait, no. <laughs> yeah, no, that was right. And p has a total of three. And this, like this, right? And then we show like this and like this. And then we show like this. And, well, actually it has six. And like this. Have you, have you learned why these two are shown as both up? Yeah, because it's four. It's 
It's lower energy. Why is it lower energy? It's aligning the magnetic fields together. It's lower energy if they're aligned together. I, I used to wonder why, you know, why do they put up, up? It doesn't matter, right? I mean, unless you put it in a magnetic field, it's not observable, right? Well, no, because they're going to interact. One electron will interact with another. Now, as long as we're talking about hydrogen atom, we don't have two electrons to interact. But if we're talking about something bigger than a hydrogen atom, something with more than one electron, they're going to interact. And if I have the electrons aligned together, it's a lower energy state. And so you're going to have the first three like this and then the next three like that. Um, yes, I mean 2s. What is? Yes, that's silly. Now, because I'm down to one minute, I'm going to come back here and just point out one last thing. I'm just going with the Hooch rule and continue it on the next class period. Unfortunately, this periodic table does not show the electron configurations. But when you get to putting in the P's, you have something interesting that occurs. So when you do these, of course, you put in the 4s1, 4s2. And so one's going to be up, one's going to be down. And I'm guessing scanning is 4s2, 3d1. I'm pretty sure that's what happens. So you have 3d1, 3d2, 3d3. What do you have for chromium? Yeah. Yes. It goes 4s1, 3d5. Why does it do that? Lower energy to have them align. So in that case of chromium, you actually have lower energy to have the, the 4s just have one like this. And then the 3D have five like this. Okay, we're out of time. I'll, well, I'll see Chad maybe on Friday. <laughs>